Welcome to the Badass CEO Podcast. This is Mimi McLean. I'm a mom of five, entrepreneur, Columbia Business School grad, CPA, and angel investor. And I'm here to share with you my passion for entrepreneurship. Throughout my career, I have met many incredible people who have started businesses, disrupted industries, persevered, and turned opportunity into success. Each episode, we will discuss what it takes to become and continue to be a badass CEO, directly from the entrepreneurs who have made it happen. If you're new in your career, dreaming about starting your own business, or already an entrepreneur, the Badass CEO Podcast is for you. I want to give you the drive and tools needed to succeed in following your dreams. Welcome back to the Badass CEO. This is Mimi, and today we have Cheryl Foland on, and she's the founder and CEO of Lila B. Cheryl. I'm so excited to have you on today. And I noticed, Cheryl, that you did the transition like I did from East Coast to West Coast. I think you were like three years ahead of me. I moved out, I think it was nine years ago, but I went to LA with my family. So I'm just curious, like what made you decide to go across country? Well, it's actually a very interesting story. I wasn't all for it right away. And I actually moved out here kicking and screaming. Little did I know I would never leave. I spent a good 20 years, almost two decades in the world of private equity, working with an operating team in and out of various different companies. Inevitably, it landed me in the beauty space. But before that, I was in New York right out of college working my tail off, little to no work-life balance, a little bit more about that I'll touch on when I tell you my story and the evolution of how Lila B came to be. But we had an opportunity. We acquired Arcade Marketing. They're now rebranded as Arcade Beauty. There's just fabulous company. And uh, we acquired the company and recognized very, very soon within the first two years of running the business out of New York, just how many brands, particularly small indie brands, were based out here in California and how this market really wasn't tapped into for providing marketing and sampling solutions to beauty brands. How do you sample a product? How do you launch a product? Getting a trial use into the hands of a consumer. So uh, about two years into the arcade acquisition, um, we identified all these fabulous brands out here, Benefit, Bear Essentials, Sephora, Urban Decay, I mean, just incredible, sm- small back then, indie brands, no longer small. And so I was tapped to come out here and really tap into that that market, this market, and start to develop relationships with these brands. Uh, We then grew the sales team, grew the West Coast office. What I thought was going to be two years, and then I'd head back to New York, turned into just a fabulous work and life experience, fell in love with California, fell in love with everything here, including my husband, and uh, never went back. So, and I can't imagine, I mean, I I was pre-COVID, I was getting back there often enough because I obviously have all my friends and family still there, but I don't know. I think California is where I belong. And so I, yeah, I just love it. That's great. Yeah. We thought ours was going to be a two year little (laughs) experiment as well. And then we all decided to stay. So I totally, I totally get it. I totally get it. So how did you make the transition from your job at that point? You're still working for the private equity or were you working within the marketing company? Arcade marketing was a company underneath this umbrella. And when I moved out here, we were only two years into buying arcade. And then I, we stayed on and for probably another seven or eight years before I even started to think about launching my own brand. So I did that out here and we created, there was an East Coast, West Coast office here in the States and then Arcade was expanding globally. And I did that here, grew the business, scaled the business. Eventually, we sold Arcade. And there was sort of that moment in time of, you know, do I pack my bags, go back to New York, work with the same team that I worked with for 20 years? Or I kind of had this itch, uh, fire in my belly about a fabulous idea. And that's when I started thinking about and creating my brand. I find it interesting because, I mean, I don't know. I know a little bit about the beauty industry being like with Beauty Counter for seven years, but... 
How, I mean, it just seems like it's a very saturated market, like to get your name out there. So I'd be curious, like what all of a sudden made you think, okay, I should start my own brand. Like, where did you see what was lacking in the market to start your own? So I think there were two things. I think it was sort of a personal aha moment. Everyone talks about what was the aha moment? What was the clear white space that you identified? I think mine was a combination. I, number one, had a complete overnight transformation. I shouldn't say overnight, but it was a drastic transformation in my personal life. In New York, I was type A, fast talker, overachiever, just chaotic, frivolous, shopper, you name it. That was the world that I lived in, very fast paced, little to no work-life balance, no work-life balance, to be honest. And when I was tapped to come out here, it took me a while, you know, sort of to unwind, really embrace the culture, the people, just the different way of life. The really it's very different is so different, and you almost can't explain it. And I think you either can embrace it and never want to leave, or you're going to run back to New York. And my experience was gosh, this is a heck of a lot more fun. I feel healthier. I'm eating better. I have a better work-life balance. Just because I stop my day at six o'clock to go for a hike doesn't necessarily mean I'm going to be less successful or less effective. It's acceptable here. You know, in mm-hmm, New York, it's not the way. You're the first one in the office. You're the last one to leave. And as a female, obviously, it was even more different for me. So when I moved out here, my life dramatically changed and everything became simpler. I did everything with a much more minimalistic approach, the way I ate, the way I dressed, the makeup I wore. I mean, it was night and day from the woman that I was in New York and everything about it made me happier and healthier. And so here was this personal journey of simplification easy, minimalistic, healthier and happier. And then at the same time, here I am, I land in the beauty industry and I am sitting around the table with these incredible, soulful, passionate entrepreneur founders. I'm learning a lot from when I was in New York with bigger brands to when I moved out here with small indie brands that were scrappy. And it was really, really inspiring. But what I did recognize is as incredible as that was for me from a business perspective, brand after brand, launch after launch, I really truly recognized that the transformation that I had made personally was not happening in the beauty industry. And it was continuing to be sort of frivolous and chaotic oftentimes, you know, encouraging women to buy more, 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 more. And the inspiration behind the brand really became my newfound philosophy, my newfound way of life. How can things be simpler? How can a brand make beauty simple again? And so it wasn't that one aha moment of saying, you know, this is the one product that's missing in the world. It was really saying, you know, when I got out of university in the early 90s, completely giving away my age. Bobby Brown. Bobby was simple and easy yep. and it didn't matter. My mother, my sister, mm-hmm. we, we would all love the neutral, simple. She made it easy. Now there's thousands and thousands of SKUs, but I still swear by that brand because it is the epitome of timeless, ageless, classic brand. So, you know, when I was at this point of thinking about a simpler brand, I thought about bringing things back to basics, really the modern day Bobby. And how can I make it simpler and easier? Because the woman of today or the man of today would like that. Everyone wants it. But what they're not willing to do is compromise looking fabulous or feeling fabulous. Mm -hmm. So the entire line is not only clean without compromise, incredible skin beneficial ingredients infused into all of our pigmented products, but every single product in my line is multi-purpose. So it's two, three, if not four products in one. So I'm streamlining the beauty routine and I'm encouraging the consumer to buy less, not more. Mm -hmm. Now, my investment banker husband... (laughs) Didn't understand how that was going to be a model to make any sort of money. I was just going to say that. That's a hard thing with me when you're trying to look for outside funding. You're like, okay, they only have to buy three SKUs instead of eight. They're going to buy less, less, less. But it really was 
a reverse psychology of less is more. With less, you are more. We don't need all of this stuff in our lives. And the interesting thing, Mimi, is that, you know, I launched the brand five years ago, but think about what's happened over the past eight months. Women realize, men realize, they don't need so much stuff. And it doesn't have to do with just makeup, just skincare, but it's even about your wardrobe and right. of, of what you've been using and how simple and easy and minimalistic things have been. So I think, you know, right now is an interesting time for us because people are embracing that, you know, three mm-hmm. is all you need. This is simple and easy. This one product is really three products in one. And this is all I really need to run out the door, to hop on a Zoom So it's been very interesting. It's obviously a philosophy and a belief that I embraced 12, 13 years ago when I first moved here and continue to, but it's a moment where I think the beauty industry and the beauty consumer is really thinking long and hard about what do you need? It's about being mindful. Right. Exactly. So when you launched, I mean, obviously you were already in the industry, so you knew, I would assume how to launch because you knew how to market and sample and all that. What would you say the hardest part about launching was in a market to get your name out that is kind of saturated? So it's really interesting. As much as I thought I knew a lot about the industry, once you start digging around and you start putting your business plan together and you start thinking about your concept and how do you take this concept and bring it to life, there was a lot that I didn't know. What I did have and what I was very, very fortunate, even to this day, super grateful, is I had this incredible network, whether it was from a financial perspective, a manufacturing perspective, or people in the beauty industry, founders who have done this before, incredible CEOs who have you know, built incredible incredible brands, lots of incredible advice and guidance and fans to really support and encourage me. The challenges for me was even though I had some relationships and people really were intrigued by my concept and my idea, this is very interesting. It's not only clean, but it's locks, it's multi-purpose, it's making things simple. It wasn't really on trend when you think about developing six and a half years ago. But I think the most challenging thing for me was getting people not only to take a chance on me, but also to really understand the economics of it. You know, there are minimum order quantities. You're not just ordering 200 units from a manufacturer. So whether it's packaging, formulations, filling, unit curtains, you name it, everything sort of has a minimum. And those are not the things that you think about. And if you're launching just one product, that's fabulous. But I launched with 12 SKUs. So I think the challenge there was being able to sort of work with suppliers, negotiate with suppliers, pace yourself because you really didn't know what your supply chain needed to look like. When I first launched, I was just launching on my own direct to consumer and at one or two specialty stores, but you didn't know what sort of inventory you were going to need. And I am manufacturing everything overseas. So all of my products are manufactured in Italy up until last year, and then our new skin treatment, skin prep products are produced in Japan. So supply chain is obviously a little bit of a challenge, but early on, I think that was probably the biggest challenge is trying to work around that there aren't a lot of suppliers that really cater to the small brand. And you're also a clean brand, right? Your products are clean as well. Now, did you, when you did launch, talking about your inventory, were you able to predict it properly or because the lead times tend to be like two or three months, correct? So it's like, you don't know if you launch all of a sudden, you know, if you're going to run out or not, did you run out or how did that work? So within the first year I did, but I did also have, I had backup componentry on standby. So if you think about beauty products, whether it's skincare or color cosmetics, there's obviously a shelf life to them. So Mm -hmm. what I did was I thought ahead and I produced everything from unit cartons to components and I had, you know, safety stock there. So even though I ran out of inventory within my first year, it was pretty easy to get things moving quickly, but it's really very hard. I even find it challenging to this day. You could sort of predict 
if you think something might be a hero product. But you know what? You have one incredible influencer. You have one incredible retail partner. Something happens and all COVID. (laughs) Something happens. So you're either long on inventory or an influencer absolutely wipes you out. But it's, you know, it's all things that you have to really ebb and flow and and try to manage the best you can. Where did the name come from? It's interesting. Everyone always asks if my middle name is Lila or if I have a daughter, Lila. Lila was my Rhodesian Ridgeback. She was really part of my newfound healthy transformation in California. I got Lila when I moved here and she was really a part of my newfound healthy lifestyle. It was running. It was hiking. She came to my office every single day when I was at Arcade. And she lives on in the brand. She passed away last summer. And we now have a one-year-old puppy running around here somewhere, another Rhodesian. But yeah, she's she was really special. And I was still single. And it was me and Lila. And yeah, and it was it was a really great time. And I hadn't ever, ever made time for anything other than work, work, work when I was back East. So it was very refreshing. Oh, that's great. I love that name. I love that story. Have you had to use outside funding? So we pretty much bootstrapped the company, the brand to launch. And then we we have been fortunate enough to have raised friends and family capital throughout our four and a half years now, which is fantastic. I do think that there's a moment in time where you have to ask yourself, you know, what is needed to really scale the brand in a big way. And growth capital is it. And it probably would have been the moment in time this year for us, but for obvious reasons, it's not happening today. But we've been very, very fortunate between just my husband and I and and our friends and family. But I do think that, you know, going back to your earlier question, that's also another challenge is really predicting what it's going to cost to get something off the ground and then what it will continue to cost to really continue to build the business. And oftentimes it's almost like a home renovation. You're usually way off <laughs> what your initial budget was. Yeah, we we have been way off. And I think a lot of beauty brand founders would probably agree that they've had the same experience. So I always say it takes double the amount of time and double the amount of money. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. I laugh now. It's it's not very funny, but <laughs> it's stressful moments. But oh yeah, it's it's one of the things when I talk to, you know, we have we have some of the FITM graduates that come up from LA and they spend some time at our office and they're they're looking for inspiration, they're looking for mentorship, and they ask really interesting questions. And I always say it is really challenging to predict how much it's going to cost to build a business and, and to get it off the ground. So, um, yeah. But now, yeah. if anybody who's listening, who's trying to start a company right now, how would you suggest them bootstrapping? Like, are there any kind of tips that you have found that enables you to save money in the beginning? I mean, I think that I was extremely scrappy with headcount early on. So I wore many, many hats and only had one employee for almost my first nine, 10 months before I started hiring people. So I think that that was a lifesaver for me, but I also had incredible insight from other people, beauty experts, industry people that I had in my network. I also think the important thing to do is early on, rather than taking on significant operating expenses internally, I farmed out a lot. So I had digital farmed out. I had someone focused on my you know, social platforms. I had my website development farmed out. I had mm-hmm. people. So it really was all third party. And then inevitably, you really find out what might be better to bring in-house once you can afford to do so and what might be more effective by bringing it in-house. But right. I think not necessarily taking that risk early on with headcount and building up your team right away. That was probably one of the most, that's one of the most important things I would, I would recommend. Did you have trouble finding like outsourcing? I mean, there's so many people doing so many different things now, right? Different companies. Like how do you find the right one? How do you find the one that's going to get you the you know, biggest bang for your buck? Was that through references? Is there a website you use to find that? Like, how did you find those resources? It was all in the network. And that's why I think it's so important for anyone, you know, mm-hmm. who's considering starting a brand to really try to 
reach out and not feel, you know, nervous or embarrassed in any way, reach out to experts, people who are interested in and open to providing you with advice based on their successes, based on their failures. When I was in the industry, obviously I met some of the most incredible labs and manufacturers and product development people and marketing people. So I had had those connections. And obviously you make one call and say, who's the digital agency that you mm-hmm. would recommend? And if you hear the same name two or three times, then obviously That's someone with. endorsed. Yeah. So I think it's really just um, asking around. And I'll be completely honest with you, within my first two years, there were probably one or two that didn't work out. But Obviously, Mm -hmm. it's not a a full-time headcount or a huge waste of your time and money. You find out early on. Yeah. Was there a point that you're like, okay, this is going to work? Like, oh my gosh. Because I think starting a business, right? What's the the percentage? The percentage is it's not very high that it lasts more than four or five years. So was there a point you're like, okay, this is going to work? I think it was obviously the retail partners that were interested and intrigued by the brand early on. And we were obviously trying to pace those launches for obvious reasons. I didn't have resources. I didn't have a tremendous amount of inventory. So within the first two years, I was really pacing the wholesale growth. But seeing and hearing the feedback and how the brand was resonating, particularly with seasoned buyers that are in space, was when I sort of had that moment. You think that your product is fabulous and you believe in it and you're passionate about it and your friends and family that are surrounding you, you know, you know that they must love it, but they're also being kind, but it's really going out to strangers and seeing their, their response to it. So it was really when the seasoned buyers, particularly when we ended up launching at Sephora was really when I I felt really confident that we had something super special and very unique. Right. That's great. Now, typically cosmetic companies, their exit strategy is usually bought by other brands, like bigger brands. Is that typically what the exit strategy is? My husband has always told me, and, and I hear him even say it, say it to others who start their own businesses. You know, if you start thinking about the exit from day one, you're never, ever going to get anywhere. You really, mm. have to, you know, you might have your two year, three year, four year plan. Sometimes even five or 10. But the reality is you have to really truly believe in what you're doing today and focus. Right. And maybe um, there is no eggs. Maybe you're like, I'm going to just keep doing this forever it, and I'm happy. No, I mean, at the end of the day, I mean, I love the brand. I couldn't imagine not being involved in the brand. And I feel like there's still so much more for me to do. So to think about an exit, I'm thrilled to see some of these brands and how they secure significant investment from mm-hmm. incredible backers and eventually sell to some of these big conglomerates. I think it's it's awesome. But I don't know that it's everyone's goal. I think I think ours is just keeping my head down and getting things right because I do think there's still so much more for us to do. But I think that there's so many different levels to the next step, right? There mm-hmm. is bringing in, you know, significant investors and partners that can help you scale the business in a different way, whether it's going globally, whether it's, you know, having enough capital to really scale the business much bigger than you could do on your own. Yeah, it's a different world this year in particular. Yeah. Now, has your business, how has it changed because of COVID? Like what percentage was going direct to retail versus online and now? Well, there's a couple different things that have changed. We were predominantly wholesale, but we had a nice direct to consumer business. The problem with that is that no matter how strong your direct to consumer business might be and how loyal your customer base is, we still are color cosmetics. And so who's wearing cosmetics and who's replenishing? So there was kind of like a double whammy here to us, right? Brick and mortar gets shut down and we are actually sold in over 600 brick and mortar doors at this point across our retailers in and out of the United States and uh, into Australia, Canada. And so when you think about being predominantly a wholesale brand, you're affected by the brick and mortar closures. So you're trying to pivot to support your retail, your retailers.com platforms, which by way of sampling and, you know, digital strategy and doing master classes and doing lots of founder stuff. So to be able to support those businesses, but then taking a good hard look at your direct to consumer and saying, okay, no one is buying eyeshadows. No one is buying pigmented products. 
And I have to be completely honest with you, would have never guessed this, but our skin prep products launched mm-hmm. in January. And thank God, because they actually have carried us through this moment. Yeah, because everyone wants to take care of their skin. Everyone's into taking care of their skin. Yes. They're like, I finally have time to take care of my skin. Yes. I'm going to do that. So, you know, the sort of risky move of crossing over into a different category, if you will, for Lila B. I felt super confident, but you just never know how it's going to go. I think the COVID situation has really proven that those hero products for us right now is really what's resonating. And it's also helping us also with our retail partners. But I just think overall, color is challenging right now. Clean is not. You know, women are- It's becoming trendy and everyone's into that because they're health. The mega trend of health, wellness, clean ingredients, clean without compromising. But let's face it, no one's wearing makeup. Are you utilizing any of the Instagrammers and influencers at all? We are. We are. We we have an incredible influencer community that we've developed over the years, and we've done lots of user-generated content right now. So mm-hmm. whether it's Instagram takeovers, which really, truly can show the experience of, you know, three is all you need. This is how simple and easy Lila B is. But we also have incredible influencers and affiliates that talk genuinely and honestly about the brand, about the Mm -hmm. performance. Everything that we do is unpaid. That has been my belief from day one. I myself am a very genuine, authentic person. I think it trickles into the brand and everything that we do across all of our platforms and our partnerships is true and genuine. And it really helps because I think that Anyone who knows the brand, hears of the brand, everything is true and real. How do you, you said you don't pay them. Do they do affiliate? How are they getting compensated? Uh, One of two things, either A, they would like the opportunity because they clearly love the brand and they would like to have something obviously for their followers. So they're always in need of content or there's an affiliate where they can offer either promotional opportunities. So like a discount code Mm -hmm. to their followers, or even a commission-based opportunity. Right, like a percentage, yeah. Yeah. So it's sort of an extension of your sales team, if you will. But a majority of it is, yeah, just mutual, genuine mm-hmm. relationships and unpaid. That's great. I saw online you have a, a one-on-one consultant. Talk about that. Because I, I was like, oh, that's interesting. I, I should do that. So <laughs> another really, really interesting pivot after COVID hit. So I had... On my team, gosh, I had seven people in-house and 40-plus freelancers out in the field that focused on supporting our retailers. So in brick-and-mortar environments, they would go into stores and train and educate and support a lot of the retail doors. And so obviously after COVID shut down, they had nothing to do and there were no jobs. So what I did was almost everyone was furloughed right out of the gate. And then as we quickly tried to pivot to think about what we will be doing, what we need to do to be able to mimic that in-store experience of being able to you know, engage with a consumer, you know, obviously they can't touch and feel the product, but how great would it be to have a real-time one-on-one conversation? So I took my head of education, brought her back. We added a couple of others and they are literally working from home and people sign up for the virtual one-on-ones. We'll follow up with them and, and make sure that they're happy with their purchase or if they want to learn more about the brand. And it's really been going extremely well. Some of the people are, you know, already Lila B fans. And there are others that obviously have a lot more time. They're at home, they're in front of the computers, and uh, they want to learn. So yeah. it's great. And I've been able to sort of pivot and change the roles of people that were on my team pre-COVID. Oh, that's great. That's great. Any advice to anyone who's thinking about entrepreneurship or starting their own company, either what it takes to be an entrepreneur or any tips of like, hey, I wish I'd known this before I started? I think there's a couple of things. I think that you really have to, as an entrepreneur, you really have to be okay with taking risks. If you're not risk adverse, I think that it's um, uh, it could be a challenge, no matter what you're launching, no matter what you'd like to start. 
I also truly believe, and I don't know that I ever really, really appreciated it as much as I do today, particularly after COVID and the, the challenging business environment right now, but you really do need to surround yourself with the most supportive people, people that can lift you up even during a difficult time or really just help you along with your journey. There's really no time and space for naysayers. And so I really think it is surrounding yourself with people who will help you get through both good and bad times. Mm -hmm. That's good advice. Yeah. Do you believe it is important for entrepreneurs to have experience before starting their own company? Absolutely. I think it's very interesting today to see all of these men and women in college and they are taking entrepreneurship courses and they want to come out and they have this brilliant idea and they want to start a brand, you know, right when they get out of college. And I encourage them to keep that dream in their head. But at some point in time, you are going to need experience and it's going to be surrounding yourself with seasoned people that you can learn from, both good and bad, successes and mistakes, but also just to truly understand what it takes to run a business. And I think that smaller, scrappier businesses or brands, you could learn a lot more because you can kind of get your hands involved in the collaboration a little bit more so than big, big companies or big firms. But I think the fact that I was in and out of various different companies gave me a lot of really interesting insight. I was not a marketing expert. I was not a finance expert. I wasn't the CEO of any of these companies I was in and out of, but I had the opportunity to be able to work within a company and learn the ins and outs. And it depends on really what you're passionate about, but I don't Mm -hmm. think that you can really truly launch a brand, launch a product, a business, a service business, unless you've had some sort of experience and it could have been bad experience. And you know that that's what you absolutely do not want for yours. But I think it's very important. Especially for the networks, like we were talking about before, about like how it's just knowing who to call to ask, like who is the right digital marketing person, right? Because otherwise you really wouldn't know who that person is if you didn't have the person to call. A network. You have a network that can help you vet rather than making mistakes. You really want to make sure that going forward, you do have different voices around the table and that you have people that you can reach out to. And I think that you learn a lot about that through your professional journey. So no matter, I mean, think, think about my years. I was working for 20 plus years before I started my own brand. So I've had a lot of professional experience and I have a lot of incredible ex-colleagues that I reach out to on a daily, weekly basis. And I think that's really, really important. Right. So you would not have been able to do what you've done in five years if you had done that right out of college. There's no way. I might have tried. I persevere and I probably would have given it up my best shot. But I think the two decades of, of my work experience has given me the foundation to feel super confident in the decisions that I made when I pulled together the idea and brought the brand to life. I think I couldn't have done it without that experience. Mm -hmm. No, it's totally true. I think the only thing would be different is if if someone had invented something, right? That's like completely changing the market. Like you're not going into a market that's been saturated, that you came up with an idea that you're like, wait, this is complete white space. Nobody is doing this. I can't believe this app hasn't been made. I'll figure it out right? Because you have no competition. But if you're going up against competition, it's a different ballgame. And I think to your point, if it is something absolutely fabulous and new, then maybe what you're doing is you're not necessarily getting, you know, work experience at some tech company, but you're surrounding yourself, whether it's a tech investor that's going to invest in your idea or an expert that's going to come in from an operational perspective and help you get it done because they've done it before. I do think you either need to have the experience yourself or you need to surround yourself with people who know what they're doing Mm -hmm. to help you, you know, through the journey. That brings up a good point. It's like, if you're going to be investing and getting investors, either friends and family round or the angel round, make sure it's smart money, right? Money that it doesn't just be money. It's money that opens up doors for you. They kind of know what, what your business is. 
there's value add. So it's while, while I think it's fantastic to have people who can support you from a financial perspective and help you, you know, with capital just to either start your business or continue to grow your business. It also is really great to be able to have value add people around the table that can bring something different, different than what mm-hmm. I know because I, I clearly don't know everything. And it's wonderful to be able to have people surrounding you who can help you either vet a certain decision or guide you when you're really stumped. That's great. I am so appreciative of your time and I'm very impressed with everything that you've accomplished, especially during COVID. And I wish you the best as you keep growing your business. And thank you so much for coming on. And if anybody wants to check, you can go to Sephora. Obviously some of the stores are open again or lilab.com. Lilabeauty.com. Yep. Perfect. Thank you so much. Is there any other last minute tips or? No, I mean, obviously if anyone ever wanted to reach out to me, I am that person that would love to pass on anything and be helpful to anyone. But yeah, anyone wishing to pick a brain, I'm here. That's really sweet of you. I know I just wrote a little article on my website about mentorship. Like I wish I was talking to somebody and they were, we were talking about mentorships and, you know, I was like, you know, I actually never, I've met some incredible people in my life and my journey. And I never kind of like formally been like in my mind, like, Hey, I'm going to have them be like my mentor and get me there. And I was like, I wonder like how my like professional life would have been different if I had done that, because I think most people who have done very well successfully, like building companies have not done it alone, no. right? They have done it with other people that are literally bringing them along. You cut off years of mistakes or like the amount of money that you cost you for making mistakes can be lessened by having mentors. So agree. And I think it works both ways. It's, you know, reaching out to try to develop the opportunity to be a mentor, or it's someone who, who wants guidance along the way and to reach out. And it's hard, it's hard to find that person, but I think surrounding yourself with supporters at the bare minimum is, is so important. That's awesome. Thank you again. This has been amazing. I'm so glad we got to talk. Have a great week. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you again for joining Badass CEO this week. Come back next week. And also don't forget to visit us at thebadassceo.com to learn more about Cheryl and also see our great show notes. And please subscribe to our podcast so that others can find us. Thanks so much. Thanks so much.